as you might know, as Clarence has said, that we have started a new year of appointment. And I celebrate humbly that this is the beginning of the sixth year. And the church is still standing. Uh, But I have learned many, many things. And one of the many things I have learned in these past years is that families come in different colors, in different shape, in different fashion, in different forms. And being part of a family does not necessarily mean that you have the perfect life. We have broken families, we have dysfunctional families, but we also have families that help other ones walk through this life. Which takes me to you. A church is like a big family. Yes? Sometimes we don't get along. Sometimes. Sometimes we are super nice to each other. But when there is a new life coming to the family, there is a sense of pride, a sense of hope. We embrace life. It seems that when there is news of new life, there is the surprise factor. The most, com- the most common is, really? Is it really happening? Are you sure? And then there's the wait, the expectation. During those nine months, you get the room ready, get clothes, diapers, you sleep as much as you can. And I have been fortunate, fortunate enough to be present when a couple has announced that they are expecting or are applying to adopt. Nine months is a long time to embrace a new life, but waiting to embrace a fully developed human for over a year. Investing time, money, and doing a ton of paperwork is no joke. New life in the family should always be embraced, should always be welcome, and that's something that Paul is trying to share with us. The book of Ephesians is about the church, the eternal purpose of God in Christ. The epistle takes us to a contemplation of the divine plan. Obviously, God wants us to understand something about his eternal purpose. It starts, like many letters of the first century, an identification of the author, their recipients, their greeting. It is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. The letter has the authority that Christ gives to the apostles. It is a revelation of the mind of God. Then Paul adds, by the will of God, the, the letter becomes solidified, becomes solid, and still is. We are reading what God wants us to know. Paul wrote to the saints and the faithful, the word saints refers to Christian, not to a, an alleged spiritually elite. All Christians are saints. Did you know that? Did you know that you're a saint? We're working on it. Okay. To your person, you're right. Tell them, you're a saint. To the person on your left, you're trying too hard. (laughs) All Christians are saints because they are cleansed by the blood, dedicated to God and set apart for divine service. They were the faithful because they exercised faith in Christ. They believed the gospel, obeyed and continuously lived in it. The saints and the faithful are in Christ. Being in Christ means that a person has been united with him, is hidden in him, enfolded by him, embraced by him, held by him, and lives in him. Together the faithful are his body, the church. Paul greets them with the spiritual thought of grace and peace, and these are common terms in Greek and Hebrew circles, but the words take on fuller meaning in the Christian context. Grace means favor. When talking about God, it refers to the favor bestowed in our interest, which is undeserved. God is praiseworthy because of his grace freely given. This favor is priceless and saving. If God were not gracious, we will have no hope. Grace is coupled with peace. Grace is what God bestows. Peace is a result of those who receive grace. We cannot be at peace with God without receiving 
His grace. We have peace with God and remain in His grace when we are justified through obedience to the gospel. Accordingly, Paul salutes all readers to, of Ephesians, wanting us to know the fullness of the Lord's favor, the sufficiency of His grace, the reconciliation it effects, and the tranquility of being right with God. Remember, at this time, Christianity is young. Christ, Christianity is barely small groups, house groups scatter from Jerusalem through Asia Minor all the way to Rome. Paul is speaking about this thing, grace, something that I believe we need to understand and do better. Do you think there's room for improvement in the family? I believe so. I believe the family of Christ can always improve in discipleship, in hospitality, in sharing the good news, in being graceful with one another. I remember my dad's word to not only be nice to people, but to care for the other person. To be with the other people in their lives, to consider every person a member of the family of Christ. And why is that important? Because the lives we live as followers of Christ have to emulate, look like, feel like, preach Christ. What do we know about Christ? He always had time. He always listened to people. He treated everyone as part of the family. He made the unwanted, wanted. Sometimes his words... His words were soft and loving, and some other times they were challenging. But in all, there was always love and care. What Paul tells us today is not out of the ordinary or shocking. It is what God has already done in Jesus Christ. As I kept reading the scripture over and over, I couldn't help but feel a level of familiarity. Not so much that I feel like Paul is my new best friend, but more like I felt included in the letter. Paul keeps repeating the, and stating, we, us, and you. As I kept looking around, I found that many theologians cannot see eye to eye about who is it that Paul is talking about. Us, the Gentiles, or the Jews? Is it relevant to make such a distinction? Paul is no more eliminating the distinction between Jew and Gentile than he is between women and men or between husband and wife in marriage when two become one. As much as a husband and wife are alike and share one view of things, most of the time, they are distinct from one another. The unity is on a deeper level than mere identification. That's why I couldn't leave it alone. Maybe it's just semantics, but bear with me. When Paul says we or us, there are three main possibilities. The us and we are all Jesus followers, regardless of status, Jew or Gentile. Number two, the us and we are the apostles, and the you are the believers who follow the apostles. Or number three, the us and we is Israel, and the you is the growing community of Gentiles, of Gentiles, Jesus followers. In Ephesians, again and again, we see Paul reassuring and edifying a non-Jewish community of Jesus' followers who felt second class. These humble believers faced persecution from the synagogue. It is quite likely that in the heart of the Roman Empire cult, and we know that Asia Minor was a hotbed of emperor worship, these non-Jews were being threatened by the synagogue as illegal cultists to be turned into the authorities. And Paul is aware of all this chaos, of all this separation and distinction, Yet in his eyes all are children of God, part of the family of the Messiah, everyone adopted by grace. And we know that because he tells us that God blesses in Christ. He chose us in him. He adopted us through Jesus Christ. God's grace is given in the beloved. Redemption is in him. Forgiveness of sins is because of him. God's purpose is in him. Salvation is through him. God alone is the source of all spiritual blessing, and Christ is the only way to approach them. God's only plan, God's plan of salvation is inseparable from Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7 defines salvation as redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
And salvation is not just closing the gap between our reality and our ideal existence and thus achieving self-fulfillment. Salvation is not finding freedom from the world and its suffering through self-migration. Salvation is not human achievement. God revealed to us in our origin, our nature, our sinful state, our needs, our purpose, and the way of salvation. Salvation is redemption by God. It is accomplished by someone taking our place, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. See, sin is a problem, and salvation in Christ, the solution. And here's something that still makes my mind go for a loop, because of the sin of the first Adam, remember Eve, Garden of Eden, disobedience, we're all falling from the short, we're falling short of the grace of God. And in the Messiah, because of the sacrifice of the begotten Son of God, we are all redeemed. Because of his sacrifice, we're called brothers and sisters, children of God. We were not born perfect. Some of us. Oh, you're included. But we had to be adopted, brought into the family of God. This adoption was not an easy one. There was a lot of paperwork to be filled up, time investment, life investment. So you and I can hear the words, welcome to the family. The story doesn't end at the welcome. It barely starts for you and for me and for many who feel unwanted, unloved, unheard, and without a family. The good news is that God's grace, this infinite grace that Paul talks about, is the one that creates in us a sense of belonging in the family. The paperwork and the waiting is done. God, the Creator, has been expecting you and is expecting a whole world to join the family. And here's the challenge for us this morning. Remember I said, are you ready? And then I said, are you sure? This is the challenge. To go into the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Baptizing them. Teaching them everything that Jesus has taught us. Welcoming embracing everyone into the family. Are you ready? Amen.